Okay. Um, oxygen therapy, so again, and this is in the pre-recorded lecture, it talks about these are interventions for um, kind of the broad range of respiratory problems, not just one specific one, okay? Children are a little bit different when it comes to oxygen therapy because you gotta kind of do uh, what they'll um, agree to. They may not leave a nasal cannula on, okay? Or they may not leave a mask on. The parent may have to hold it. Um, so you may have to kind of compromise in order to get that oxygen therapy to you. Um, again, with suctioning, just make sure you know with children, their anatomical differences is going to make you choose different size um, suction catheter, um, go down and not as far as you do in your adults because they have a shorter trachea. Okay. This is, um, I will say, I rearranged slightly. Same exact slides, but I rearranged slightly this morning. Don't freak out. Okay, just go, go with the flow. All right, respiratory system differences. You have the picture. Their airway is shorter. It's narrower. The bronchial division is higher and at a different angle. So this is why we talked about um, kids aspirating things more easily than adults and it going usually into the right side of their lungs because that angle allows for that in children. And children put a lot of things in their mouth they're not supposed to, which adults know better, right? Newborns are nose breathers, we talked about. We talked about the alveoli being underdeveloped and not as many. We talked about the smooth muscle. They use their diaphragm to breathe. They have a higher metabolic rate, so they consume more oxygen. So when they get in respiratory distress, it happens more quickly um, because they already consume more oxygen. What do they do when they start to have trouble to breathe? They breathe faster. It depletes their glycogen reserves, which they have fewer of to begin with. So then you have problems faster than you do in adults. Okay. Um, this is just a short 30 second video of what retractions look like. Most of you all have probably seen them or at least a, know what they are. which is a really long word, so that's why LTV is there, okay? Um, epiglottitis, which is the most severe form, um, is a bacterial form of the curve, not viral. So it could be viral or bacterial. What do you think the difference in treatment is? Antibiotics, Antibiotics or just supportive, correct. So with your epiglottitis, it's the most serious, so when they swallow, it can occlude their airway. A lot of times they'll sit in the forward position, they call that the tri pod position so they can open their airway more easily. Kind of hands on the leg and then forward. Okay, you like that presentation? Okay. Um, this can be life threatening and you do not want to leave the child unattended with the epiglottitis. Okay, because if their airway includes and they stop breathing, you want to be able to be there so you can intervene, right? Um, the thing with respiratory problems, if the child is restless and is fighting and is struggling and then all of a sudden they get quiet and they're not restless anymore, bad sign. Okay, things are worsening, not improving. Okay, same with wheezing. So if you have a child with asthma, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, where you listen to the breath sounds and they're struggling to breathe and they're wheezing and then all of a sudden that <coughs> stops, okay, you think, well, wheezing 
resolved, good, not always. We could have just stopped air movement, right, which is a bad sign. Um, so croup in general is a viral or bacterial invasion of upper airway that extends larynx, trachea, and sometimes the bronchi. Okay. Another slide here. So. Here's um, symptoms, barking, cough, crowing sounds, which I have a video of here in just a second. Um, Schreier this, uh, gets worse at night or may sometimes only occur at night. So you may have a parent bring a child to the emergency room that says, oh my goodness, it's struggling to breathe, it's barking, you know, I was scared to death, and then they get to the emergency room and the child's fine. Okay, happens all the time. Um, increase in fall and winter months may progress to a hypoxic state. They may have a temperature, most common, three months to three years of age, and this, the common time period kind of depends on what form of group it is. Okay, this is referring to the LTV one. Um, upper respiratory infections are frequently um, seen before um, the group takes place. Restlessness, retractions are also seen. Um, let's see, we talked about that. Worst symptoms at night. Why do you think, okay, you're seeing an uh, increased incidence fall winter, okay? Child's at home, can't breathe, right? So sometimes they arrive at the emergency room and they can breathe and they seem fine. Why do you think that is? <coughs> Code air. All right, so you'll see some books that say expose the child to cold air, okay, and it helps them breathe better. And you'll see some people say a warm, moist environment, okay. Both do two different things, okay. The cold air can reduce some of the inflammation and the swelling of the airway, right. So you'll hear some moms say, well, I just stick my kid in the freezer. Well, they don't stick them in the freezer. They just kind of open the door and let the kid breathe the cool air. If you put them in a warm or a, a bathroom, with a warm, moist shower, that moist, that warmth can kind of uh, increase the the flow of the mucus that kind of plugs in those airways. Make sense? So it's the drastic change of environment that helps, not necessarily whether it's warm or cold. Make sense? <coughs> All right. That works. And that's what I say. If you, if you tell a parent both and they say, well, I stuck my kid in the freezer and it didn't help. Well, okay, we'll try warm points of record. One didn't help, try the other, right? Don't tell a parent to put their kid in the freezer. Just tell them to open the door for safety reasons. There's a sound of ball legs when it catches nothing but men. Barking off that you'll hear referred to. She took it and improve the respiratory distress within 30 minutes. It only lasts about two hours though, so what are we going to do? Just give it again in two hours? We give albuterol, racemic, epinephrine, then we can give corticosteroids along with that. Did you have a question or are you tell me something? No, I'm trying to keep up on Oh, okay. Um, I can type these out for you. Corticosteroids um, can be given, so you give the albuterol, racemic epinephrine for immediate relief, okay, within 30 minutes, and then you can give corticosteroids, IM, PO, or by nebulizer, because they have a long half-life. 
so this will kind of take care, you take care of the immediate need, the corticosteroids will kind of take care of the, um, the longer need that the child may have. Alright, moving to lower respiratory, and again these are just a little bit different order than what you got, okay? Just bear with me here. Uh, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and TB. So bronchitis is um, inflammation of the trachea and the bronchi. So you say, well, what makes that a lower versus upper? I don't know. Okay, just, um, it's, uh, they just have it in your book under lower, so that's why I put it here. But it's still, uh, it could still be considered upper airway. Symptoms are dry, high, and cough that increase at night. A deep cough, kind of like deeper in the chest. You hear of a, uh, ever hear a smoker cough? I'm sure you have it back in the old days. But. Treatment is support unless it's bacterial and then they're going to have antibiotics and obviously decrease their exposure to smoke. Secondhand smoke of any sort will complicate bronchitis. Bronchiolitis is, um, can be viral or bacterial. Inflammation and obstruction of what? The bronchial, so further down in the airway. What do you think the most common cause of this is? RSV? Yes, RSV. So you hear a lot of um, children or babies being admitted um, with RSV um, during the fall and winter months. Okay, can't tell you what it stands for. It's in your book. Somebody read it out loud. Um, it's a virus um, that children get most of the time before they turn two. If they're going to get it, they're going to get it in between zero and two years of age. Okay. It's spread by direct contact. Um, with respiratory secretions or contact with surfaces that are, or that are contaminated. So children can spread it to other children, so if they get admitted or if you know they have RSV, make sure that you keep them away um, from other siblings. Treatment is supportive, and again, they're in isolation. is infection or inflammation of the alveoli, so either, either even further down. It can be bacterial, viral, or what else? Aspiration. Y'all have heard of aspiration pneumonia. Most common pulmonary cause of death in infants younger than 48 hours of age. So if pneumonia is the most frequent cause of pulmonary deaths in infants less than 48 hours of age, do you think it's bacterial? Viral or aspiration? Aspiration, because you know all those fluids, they take a big deep breath and they suck those in. More common in C-section babies because they don't have that pressure. Signs and symptoms, fever, nasal flaring, retractions, chills, chest pain. Um, lung sounds that are not normal, so, or not normal, so adventitious breath sounds. Antibiotic if bacterial, rest, comfort measures, O2. How do we know if they need oxygen? Put them on a pulse ox. If it's less than what? 95. Yeah. IV fluids if they are unable to take PO fluids. And um, nutrition and hydration is important for any respiratory distress patient, not just pneumonia. Okay, because if they're breathing fast, what do they do? They lose water, insensible water. Right? TB, I just have written down, it's an infection transmitted through air and droplet that infect the alveoli. Um, you all know the stupid TB test that we have done. I shouldn't say stupid because I'm video. Um, not too concerned with a TB on the pediatric portion. Chronic. So, um, on your slides, if you already had them printed off, this is under lower, so I changed it to chronic. Okay. Um, respiratory tract disorders, asthma. Um, it's a big one for kiddos. Um, what happens in asthma? Okay, bronchoconstriction, right? It makes the air flow, uh, flow of air harder um, for it to happen. What can be some common triggers of asthma? Pet dander, smoke, environmental factors. Um, we said pet dander. 
uh, allergies. So kids can get those allergy testing to see what they're allergic to so they can avoid Cold. those. Yeah. Mold. Cold. Exercise-induced exercise asthma also, and we'll talk about treatment of that. Assessment, and I have wheezing uh, um, underlined. There's a quick little video. If you've never heard wheezing before, you can click on this and hear it. Um, again, if wheezing decreases or goes away, that is not necessarily a good sign. It could be that the child is no longer moving air through their airways. Okay, So if you have an asthma patient, one of the assessment findings is decreased wheezing. You want to be concerned about that until you rule out worsening. Okay. Um, you take a history um, because you want to know if there's anything um, in the family's home or anything in the family history that may lead you to believe that it's environmental or um, allergy related. Um, things that you can actually remove or remove the child from. So you won't, if you remove them from what's causing the asthma, you take care of the problem, right? Easiest intervention. Um, they will diagnose. Um, Anybody know what a peak expiratory flow rate monitor is? Okay, they, so you know the incentive spirometers that you show surgery patients how to use in the hospital? It's pretty similar to that. Okay, I have a short video here in just a second on how to teach a child to do that. You want them to do it in order to determine their personal best. Okay, and if they do the peak expiratory flow rate monitoring at home, it will show a decrease from their personal best before they start to show symptoms of an asthma attack. Okay, so if they're routinely doing these and they see a decrease in the peak expiratory flow mo or monitor number, they'll say, okay, I haven't had an attack yet. However, my numbers have went down. I need to intervene somehow. Okay? Um, I'll talk about meds in here in just a second. How about now? Oh, um, Another thing uh, with uh, people with airway problems, you want to be very cautious on giving them iced beverages, okay? Because iced beverages can trigger a bronchospasm, okay? So maybe cooled beverages or room temperature beverages may be a better option for somebody in respiratory distress. Cause it causes what? Bronchospasm. And just FYI, athletes are at higher risk for bronchospasm than people that aren't athletes. Stronger airways and stronger muscles surrounding those airways. Medications. Don't frantically write because I'll type these for you because I'm nice. Um, but what if someone is having an acute asthma attack? What do you think they're going to get? Okay. A short acting beta 2 agonist, which is albuterol. Usually given in a meter dose inhaler or by nebulizer. It relaxes smooth muscle, causes rapo, rapid bronchodilation and mucus clearing. So if someone can't breathe, we want them to be able to breathe very quickly, and this will allow that. How do you think, what side effects do you think the kid might feel? Jittery and nervous. You'll hear of some people being addicted to their albuterol inhaler because it kind of gives them that excitement feeling. Okay, those are your normal side effects. You want the child using these less than two days a week. If they're using it more than two days a week, then you need to initiate some other form of therapy. Okay. Another quick relief uh, could be corticosteroids, but it's not, I'm having an asthma attack, let's skip the albuterol and give corticosteroids. Okay. The corticosteroids are giving in addition to the albuterol. Okay. So you may give the albuterol, it may not work. Or you may give the albuterol and it does, doesn't have the effects that you want it to have, so you can add the corticosteroids to that. Make sense? Okay. Uh, corticosteroids will decrease inflammation, secretions, and enhance the effect of the albuterol. Give with food. Give in the morning because your body's natural corticosteroid release happens the majority of the time in the morning. So if you give corticosteroids in the morning, it mimics the body's natural production of that. And you want to continue these until 80% of their personal best is achieved on this peak expiratory flow monitor. If someone's on corticosteroids for a long term, what do you think are some side effects you may see? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so weight gain, because it makes you really hungry, right? Decreased growth for children, you want to be concerned about because they're growing at uh, faster rates. Unstable blood sugars, immunosuppression. And how does it make someone attitude-wise? Make them very, very cranky, right? So this adds extra stress and extra complication to the parenting role if their child's on corticosteroids, right? Make sense? All right. Paper says over. I need to go here. Okay. Um, daily, you, okay, so in Pearson, I know there's very few things in Pearson I point to, but on page 1276, it starts to talk about a stepped approach to medication therapy. All right. Um, so what they do with asthma is they rate it based upon your symptoms as either intermittent asthma, persistent asthma, moderate asthma, or severe asthma, okay? And it's different from up to four years of age, and then that classification changes from four years and up, or five years and up, okay? Don't get too caught up, okay? We'll summarize in just a second. Main thing is your, your intermittent asthma is uh, you don't wake up at night, or zero to four years, they don't wake up at night, less than two episodes, um, they're not using any um, PRN medication, and there's no activity in interference, okay? Then you have your severe asthma, which is all the way on the other end of the extreme. Um, they're experiencing asthma attacks throughout the day. Um, they're awakened at night more than one time per week. Um, several a day, they're using their inhaler several times a day, and their activity is extremely limited. So you can see both ends of the extreme. What we put the children on as far as how we treat them for asthma depends upon where they fall into this category, okay? If they're intermittent asthma, very mild, it's not affecting their activity, we're going to give them um, a short-acting um, inhaler where if they experience the symptoms, they can do a puff or two and take care of the problem, and that's it, all right? If they're above that, so if they go into the persistent category or above, then you're going to start adding other medications with that inhaler. Make sense? What do you think those other medications might be from what we just talked about? Maybe? Um, also, daily, um, speaking of long-term use, um, not only can you give short-acting beta um, antagonist, you can give long acting if it's a um, not a mild case but a more severe case. Inhaled corticosteroids, we just talked about. What about hyposensitization? How does that help? What is that? Hyposensitization. Allergy shots. Allergy shots. Yep, so a kid gets tested, you're allergic to A, B, and C, 